Okay, good. Welcome everyone to this uh, optimization session. So we have a, a great list of talks and we're gonna start with Kevin Tian. Uh, so Kevin, if you can share your slides. So the format I uh, recall for everybody, eight minutes talk. If you have a clarification question, feel free to ask. And then at the end of the uh, you know five, eight minutes talk, we will have a panel session with, where we can ask all the questions we want. Take it away, Kevin. Awesome. Thanks so much, Seb. Um, and hey, everyone. I hope you're enjoying ITCS. Uh, my name is Kevin, and I'm excited to share with you our recent work. Uh, its title is Relative Viciousness and Extra Gradient Methods and a Direct Recipe in for Acceleration. And this is joint work with Michael B. Cohen from MIT and my advisor, Aaron Sidford from Stanford. Cool. Um, so in our paper, we study uh, uh, algorithms for a broad family of problems called Solving Variational Inequalities, or BIs, in monotone operators. Um, and don't worry if you don't know what these words mean, I'll define them very shortly. So if I had to briefly summarize the main takeaways of our work, they'd be as follows. Um, we showed that a more fine-grained analysis of existing algorithms for solving BIs, based on bounding a new parameter we call relative Lipschitzness, um, yields improved rates of convergence in various interesting applications as compared to the standard predictions of BI theory. So um, notably, a number of custom analyses for solving special cases of BIs uh, which yield rates not predicted by the standard BI theory. Um, and these analyses may appear somewhat disparate at a glance. They actually fall, all fall under our framework and they can be explained um, by this single definition. So the resulting proofs are usually quite straightforward and amount to a few applications of Cauchy Schwartz. So we hope this uh, demystifies these previous analyses. Um, so one example of a special VI algorithm I'll focus on is uh, accelerated gradient descent. And this algorithm was introduced in the 80s and is a landmark result in optimization theory. Um, but its proof is described by experts as quite mysterious. Um, we also define an expected variant of our definition. Uh, and we show that a new analysis of stochastic VI algorithms yields improved rates for structured problems and um, more fine-grained randomized accelerated results. And finally, a third application captured by our framework is approximation algorithms for undirected next flow. Um, we show that this recent area convexity framework uh, proposed by Sherman for this problem um, is in fact recovered by a fine-grained uh, local variant of our, um, of our definition. So uh, for this abridged version of this talk, I won't uh, have time to get into too many details, but I wanted to mention the style I tried to capture with the full talk. Um, so I really tried to emphasize giving an intuitive introduction to extra gradient methods. Um, and the talk contains a full novel proof of acceleration from first principles uh, following our framework. So if you haven't seen that before, it might be kind of cool. Um, and if you have a chance to listen to the full version, we'd uh, really appreciate it. Cool. So um, I'll start by describing the problem family we study. So a VI is parameterized by a monotone operator G from its set to its dual, um, which satisfies the displayed conditions. So this is what it means for G to be monotone. Um, and informally, it forces the results of the operator on two points X and Y to be aligned with the direction between the two points. And we're only going to consider two examples of monotone operators in this talk. The first is just the, um, when G is the gradient of a convex function. And the second is when um, G is what we call the gradient operator of a convex concave function on two blocks. Um, so now we'll define variational inequalities. Uh, in short, solving a VI in a monotone G just asks to find a point X star such that the inner product between G of X star and X star minus X for any X in the domain is non-positive. So, um, just briefly, in the case of example one, uh, this just amounts to minimizing the convex function. And in example two, um, the solution of the VI is just the saddle point or Nash equilibrium of the convex concave function. Okay. So um, I won't go into this too much here, but the proofs that these operators are really monotone and that the solutions to, uh, to VIs are what I claimed they were uh, just directly follow from applying convexity or concavity. So um, we'll basically only be discussing one family of algorithms for solving VIs, which is collectively referred to as extra gradient methods. Um, these methods apply to a VI in an operator G and are driven by regularizer R. So the pair G comma R just defines um, the algorithm. And typically when analyzing these extra gradient methods, the regularizer R is assumed to be strongly convex, which is basically a, str a, strengthening, of, a strengthening of normal convexity. So normal convexity allows for zero curvature in a specified norm. And strong, strong convexity just means it has some positive curvature. And um, when, the, when the regularizer is strongly convex, uh, Nemirovsky showed that when the operator G is Lipschitz, then the method converges um, at a rate roughly lambda over T. 
where lambda is the Lucas parameter. And um, under, the strong, uh, under the stronger assumption that the operator G is not only strong, uh, monotone, but it's also strongly monotone, um, the method converges at the displayed rate, which is exponential in lambda over m. So this is sort of like a condition number for monotone operators. Okay. Um, so under these minimal assumptions, these rates were uh, shown to be tight even in the Euclidean norm case. So in some sense, extra gradient methods are optimal for solving VIs in monotone operators. Um, however, for a number of structured VIs, it's known that you can actually beat the predictions of the standard uh, theory. And this sort of motivated our talk. So um, perhaps the most famous example of an improvement is when the VI is just uh, in the gradient of a convex function. So as a reminder, this just means you're trying to minimize the function. And um, Nesterov's accelerated gradient descent obtains roughly a quadratic improvement upon the predictions of standard extra gradient analyses uh, for the special case. Okay, so that's one to keep in the back of your head. Um, another interesting example of a structured case that we think is interesting to a TCS audience is L infinity regression. And this setup has applications to uh, approximate max flow. So uh, obtaining one over T rates of convergence for this problem uh, with that worst de dependence on dimension uh, was a notorious obstacle until a breakthrough work of Sherman in 2017, um, following uh, a new framework called area convexity. Okay, great. So um, finally, a, a few other mysteries surround extra gradient methods. So it remains unclear what kinds of structured VIs allow for one over T rates of convergence, uh, which would match their uh, deterministic counterparts. Oh, sorry, via stochastic methods, which would match their deterministic counterparts. And um, in another line of work, a perspective known as optimism was proposed to analyze these algorithms. Two, two minutes. Sure. Um, okay, so the main conceptual contribution of our paper is a new condition characterizing the convergence rate of extra gradient methods uh, beyond this standard setup of a Lipschitz operator and a strong convex regularizer. And this characterization boils down to a simple to verify relationship between G and R. And it basically captures the rates of these structured instances we mentioned, uh, which were previously only attainable by tailored analyses. Um, I won't have time to go too much into uh, what extra gradient methods are, but maybe uh, I'll talk about it if there's time for questions. Um, but I'll briefly describe um, the motivation for our condition. Uh, the main idea is that um, uh, we, we, we view extra gradient methods as a discretization of a um, idealized method called prox point. And we directly characterize their performance in terms of the discretization error. So um, basically if the discretization error uh, if lambda is large enough, the step size parameter is large enough so that the discretization error is non-positive, um, then we say uh, G is lambda relative, uh, rel relatively Lipschitz in R. And if you look at the discretization error, we just rewrote that um, into a condition. Um, and it turns out that this, uh, this definition is strong enough to capture uh, many of the structured examples I mentioned before, including randomized variants. Um, so the main takeaway is you don't really need a new analysis for, every, uh, for each of these separate types of problems. You can just directly bound this, uh, this parameter lambda, um, which characterizes how rel relatively Lipschitz the operator is with respect to the regularizer. Um, and cool. So thanks so much for listening to our presentation. And if you want to know more, I really encourage you to check out the full version of the talk or the paper. Um, I'm also more than happy to answer your questions offline. There's a number of exciting open directions I want to take. Uh, we're, we're excited to take this work and we want to fully understand the power of extra gradient methods. Great, thanks a lot, Kevin. I think there will be lots of questions uh, during the panel session, um, but for now, let's move on to the next talk on major, majorizing measures for the optimizer. Do we have a speaker for this talk? Yeah, I can share my screen, let me try. Wonderful. All right. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, you can start. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. So this talk will be about uh, Gaussian processes. Uh, my name is Makran, and this is a joint work with Sander Bost, Daniel Dedouche, and Neil Olver. So a Gaussian process is just a collection of uh, jointly Gaussian random variables indexed by some subset x in our D. We'll assume that they're centered, mean zero. And we're interested in computing the expected supremum of such a process. So this is a very natural quantity that arises in a lot of places. For example, if you look at the Gaussian process, which is given by taking a set of extreme points of a polytope and uh, the Gaussian process is given by taking a inner product with a standard Gaussian random vector with every point in X, then the expected supremum is called the Gaussian width of this point set. And 
It's very useful in damage time theory reduction and many other places. Another example comes from random matrices. So if you take a Gaussian random matrix and uh, take X to be the uh, set of all points uh, with Euclidean norm one, uh, and the Gaussian process is given by uh, the quadratic form XAX, then the expected uh, supremum of this process is exactly the oper expected operator norm, which is very, very uh, uh, useful in a lot of places. That says it should not be surprising that it has tons of applications. Let's look at one that will be relevant for us also, which is Gordon's theorem. So this is a powerful dimensionality reduction statement. So it points that X lives on the unit sphere now and the Gordon's theorem gives you a linear map that maps it to M dimensional space where M is about the uh, width square. And the, this projection preserves all norms. And this is useful for dimensionality reduction, compressed sensing and so on. And it generalizes the well-known johnson lindstrauss strauss uh, lemma, which probably most of you are aware of it, uh, where m is about the log of the cardinality of x. But here, x could even be infinite. Okay. So now that I've probably convinced you that Gaussian processes are important, uh, one can ask how can we prove bounds and expected supremum, which is usually very difficult. So one very nice characterization of this thing was given by Sudakov, who showed that it's uniquely characterized if you define distances between two points and the points at x by the standard deviation of the random variable zx minus zy. So for example, in this simple Gaussian process, this metric is exactly the Euclidean metric, but uh, this uh, can differ in, for other processes. So now that uh, we know that it's uniquely characterized by this metric, one can ask is there some simple quantity depending on the metric that we can compute that will give us uh, you know, nice upper, upper and lower bounds. The two very nice upper and lower bounds uh, that are relatively easy to prove are in terms of the size of the epsilon net of your point set X. So an epsilon net is just a minimum set of points so that every point is within a distance epsilon from it, some point in the net. And here epsilon ranges over various scales from zero to let's say the diameter of X. The problem with both of these bounds is that they are not tight. So the, the gap can be arbitrarily large in either case. And sort of uh, motivated by this, Fernick uh, tried to improve the upper bound and he proved uh, uh, this upper bound that's called the majorizing measures bound, which is stated in terms of this optimization problem. So you have in minimum overall probability measures, then you have a supremum over all points in X and there's some weird looking quantity, uh, the integral of square root log of one over the measure of ball of radius x around epsilon. So it's a lot to parse. So maybe for intuition in this short talk, I can only give you a very hand wave intuition that sort of mu selects, uh, that's measured mu, it selects sort of a weighted epsilon net at different scale. And uh, in the end, you just want to optimize over the best possible mu. So this is uh, yeah, in some sense, a strengthening of uh, the upper bound in terms of epsilon nets. And sort of you can use this uh, uh, weighted epsilon net to define a tree structure on the metric space uh, that we call a chaining tree. And this gives you an upper bound the value of the process. And this majorizing measures bound is essentially the minimum value of any such tree. Now for any conjecture that this majorizing measures bound was tight, and this was proven by Talagrand in a very influential work and it's called the majorizing measures theorem now. So I mean, this exactly tells you that expected supremum is up to constant factors equal to the majorizing measures bound which is a very uh, uh, nice characterization of Gaussian processes. And uh, the main uh, innovation of Telegram, I guess, to prove this was to develop a dual notion of uh, packing trees. So these give lower bounds on the expected supremum just as chaining trees uh, give upper bounds. And sort of, uh, but the, the original proof was considered fairly difficult and uh, over the years, many simpler different proofs uh, have been obtained. And in this talk, we'll give another one, uh, which I think adds a lot of insight, at least to us. So to uh, say what we do, let us revisit the statement of the majorizing measures. So it's, you can break it down into two parts. The first part says that uh, the value of these chaining and packing trees, which are only defined in terms of the metric, they give you upper and lower bounds. So this is a fairly easy statement to prove. The second part is the difficult part, which is, Sort of a combinatorial min-max theorem. It says that you know the minimum value of a chaining tree and the maximum value of packing trees they are almost equal. There is some kind of strong duality between them. 
and uh, our main contribution. So first of all, this already separates the role of metric space from Gaussian process, which makes it clean. Our main contribution, we just uh, give proof of the combinatorial min-max theorem using convex duality and uh, rounding. So as uh, so the main uh, punchline is sort of that this duality between chaining and packing trees, this is in fact a convex uh, consequence of convex duality. So there is a convex program that lurks in the background, which gives rise to this. Mm. And as an application, we give like a uh, deterministic algorithms for various things. One of them is the projection in Gordon's theorem. But I will not go into that here. So let me just briefly tell you where the convex program pops up. So let's, if you look at this majorizing measures bound, this is essentially a convex program because root log one over p is convex on a, a large part of the, the interval zero to one. So you can ignore the technicality, which can be fixed. And now if you take a primal measure mu, which is a solution to this program, you can round it to a chaining tree, which gives you an upper bound on the process. So this was already proven by Talagran. And we show that if you take the dual of this convex program, then you can round it to a packing tree after simplifications, and uh, this gives you a lower bound. And the beautiful fact is the sort of fairly easily convex duality sort of implies in a nice way that these two, uh, uh, the value of chaining and packing trees are constant factors away from each other. It gives us the common to element maximum. And uh, One sort of, yeah, and I should mention that sort of the rounding is the difficult part of this proof. Uh, apart from you know, relating the, uh, the uh, primal and dual measures for the simplified dual. Because if you have a tree, then obtaining a measure that uh, satisfies, uh, that gives you optimal bounds for these problems is fairly easy. And uh, lastly, to mention that this proof is fairly algorithmic because you just want to solve an optimization problem in the end and round it. So this gives us uh, an algorithmic way to obtain all of these objects and to compute other applications. So that's all I have to say. I'll stop here. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, great talk. So next, uh, we're going to be talking about low rank approximation. And I think Cameron is uh, giving the talk. Um, yeah, let me share my screen. Uh, is that looking OK? Yeah, that looks perfect. You can go ahead. Right, great. So I'm going to be talking about um, simple methods uh, for the masked low rank approximation problem. This is joint work with Chris Musco and David Woodruff. So we're looking at low rank approximation. I have a n by n matrix A, and I want to approximate it by an n by n matrix L that only has rank K. And we typically do this to compress A or to denoise it. There's lots of applications of it. Um, a common metric that I try to minimize when I'm looking for L is I try to minimize its distance to A in the Frobenius norm. So I try to minimize the sum over all the entries in my matrix of the, the value on A minus the value on L squared. So this is the squared Frobenius norm difference between these matrices. What we're looking at today is the masked low rank approximation problem, which arises in the case when you want to perform low rank approximation when some of the entries in A are either unknown or they're corrupted or for whatever reason, they don't follow low rank structure and you just wanna ignore these entries. So we can formalize this using a binary mask matrix. Um, I have this matrix W, it's an N by N binary matrix. It has ones on the entries that I care about or that I think follow the low rank structure and it has zeros on the entries that I don't care about or are corrupted that I generally wanna ignore. And now instead of minimizing the distance between A and L where L is a low rank matrix, I'm going to minimize the distance between A and L where I only consider um, the Frobenius norm restricted to the ones in the mask. So I'm writing this as the Frobenius norm of W Hadamard product with A minus L, where this is just equal to the sum of all entries where W is equal to one of the square difference between A and L on those entries. Okay, so that's mass lower approximation. This arises in a lot of applications. Um, one example is low rank plus diagonal approximation. Often there's, there are matrices that are well approximated by a low rank component plus a diagonal component. Um, this comes up in factor analysis, which is basically PCA with different noise variances in each dimension. It's used for kernel matrix approximation in lots of different places. And the reason this is basically an instance of mass low rank approximation 
is that if I have this optimal low rank factor L, then I know exactly what the optimal diagonal matrix should be. I should just sort of correct the diagonal of L to be equal to the diagonal of A. So if I know L, D should just be equal to the diagonal of A minus the diagonal of L. So optimizing, defining the best low rank plus pentagonal approximation in the Frobenius norm is equivalent to solving mass low rank approximation, where you have a mask matrix that tells you just like ignore the diagonal of the matrix and then approximate everything else on the matrix. So in this case, our mask matrix W is kind of like an inverted identity. It's zeros on the diagonal and ones off the diagonal. That's just one example. There's lots of other examples. Um, low rank plus sparse approximation, also known as robust PCA, which um, is very well studied. It's used for, for example, for background separation. Um, low rank plus banded approximation, low rank plus block sparse or block diagonal approximations. All these different problems can be put into the same mass low rank approximation framework. And I'll note that mass low rank approximation is really closely related to matrix completion. Matrix completion is sort of where I'm given a matrix and I'm missing some entries and I wanna fill in the missing entries. Often I do this by computing a low rank approximation that matches these entries that I've seen, but the goals are very different. So in matrix completion, you're trying to fill in your missing entries. In mass low rank approximation, we don't necessarily care about the missing entries. We're just trying to approximate our matrix on the entries that we have or the entries that we care about that we think follow low rank structure. So they're kind of fundamentally different problems, but definitely very related. All right, so what's known about this problem? Maybe not surprisingly, it's NP hard in general. There are some special cases like this low rank plus diagonal case. The hardness is unresolved. Polynomial time algorithms aren't known, but they're not ruled out. Um, a lot of variants can be solved provably via convex relaxation or alternating minimization. Invariably, these types of proofs make uh, different types of assumptions. They either make incoherence assumptions on the matrix, they sort of that its mass is randomly spread out, or random mask assumptions. Like if the mask is sparse, maybe you assume that its entries are in random locations. And a lot of these proofs kind of follow in, they're, they're very closely related to the matrix completion literature. Um, there are provable approximation algorithms with no assumptions like this um, for the more general weighted low rank approximation problem where your mask isn't necessarily binary, but is just general real value mask. Um, and yeah, so there's provable approximation algorithms, but they have exponential dependencies in the rank and the error parameter and other parameters. And what we're looking for is uh, fully polynomial time algorithms. So our contributions is we give polynomial time by criteria approximations for the mass low rank approximation problem. And what this means is we give a poly time algorithm that outputs a matrix L prime whose rank is equal to K prime. K prime is gonna be bigger than our target rank. That's what this by criteria means. So it's a little bit bigger than our target rank, but we get a good error. So the um, error A minus L prime times our mask is less than the opt uh, for the best rank K approximation on our non-masked entries, plus some small additive error epsilon times the Frobenius norm of our matrix. So the real question then becomes, this is a good error bound, but what is this K prime? We ideally want K prime or by criteria to rank to be as close as possible to the true rank K. So we're sort of getting an actual good approximation to our matrix. And, um, the sort of like maybe interesting point of this paper, or like at least we thought this was kind of surprising for us initially is that we're able to obtain by criteria approximation where K prime depends on a very natural complexity measure of this mask matrix W. Um, this mass matrix W is an N by N Boolean matrix. So we can view it as the communication matrix of um, a two player communication matrix of a Boolean function that takes two inputs. One is both are in our bit strings in log n. So think about the rows and columns of this matrix are indexed by log n length bit strings. Um, we view it as a communication matrix and our rank k prime is gonna depend on the randomized communication complexity of that communication problem. So the easier it is to communicate that matrix, um, the lower by criteria rank we're gonna get. So just as an example, like in this low rank plus diagonal case that I discussed, um, you don't care about approximating matrix on the diagonal, you only care about the off diagonal. So your mask matrix is all zeros on the diagonal and all ones on the off diagonal. That's the communication matrix for the inequality problem. Um, other problems like low rank plus banded relates to the communication matrix of a variant of the greater than problem. Um, and so for all the problems that uh, we uh, look at, 
the by criteria rank that we derive from this communication complexity connection um, ends up being k times poly log n over epsilon, where that poly is usually very low poly. Um, so we get pretty good by criteria approximation results via this connection to communication complexity. Um, so our guarantees, like beyond just the results we get, our guarantees are achieved by a really simple polynomial time heuristic. Um, okay, thanks. I'm sort of low on time, so I won't give. Okay, so let me go with yeah. So our guarantees are achieved by a very simple polynomial time heuristic. And this is something that's used a lot, for example, in the matrix completion literature. All you do is you set, you let L prime be the best rank K prime approximation to A times W, meaning you zero out the entries you don't care about. And then you just take the best rank approximation of this matrix. This you can do very quickly with an SVD or there's lots of fast approximation algorithms. Um, and so I don't have enough time to sort of explain why does this algorithm give um, a by criteria approximation that has like rank related to the communication complexity. But I'll say very, very roughly, what we do is we construct an explicit rank K prime approximation that is zero on all entries that we don't care about. And we construct this by basically tiling our mask matrix by uh, using combinatorial rectangles. And we know we don't have too many of those combinatorial rectangles if that mask matrix has low communication complexity. We then show that this heuristic only does better than that construction. So the existence of a good communication protocol for a matrix certifies the accuracy of this heuristic. And so sorry that I ran out of time, but please check out the full paper um, to see that connection more clearly. It takes a lot. Great. Thanks, Cameron. Um, again, we will keep the questions for the end of the session. And next, we have agnostic learning with unknown utilities. I think you need to stop sharing. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah, is my screen visible? Like, uh, I'm in the. Yes. Uh, yes. Slides went on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Go ahead. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Kush Bhatia, and I'll be presenting our work on agnostic learning with unknown utilities. Uh, this is joint work with Peter Bartlett, Ankar Dragan, and Jacob Steinhardt. In classical decision problem, one often begins with a data set consisting of n data points. And the objective in most scenarios is to learn a classifier which predicts label y's correctly from context vectors x. Uh, within this paradigm, most works, if not all, implicitly assume that all mistakes are equally costly and that each scenario X is equally important. In reality, though, this is often not the case. So, for instance, if you consider the classification system, which is designed for a self-driving car, uh, the cost of mispredicting a roadside post office box versus that of missing out on a stop sign can actually be very different. Furthermore, consider the two scenarios shown in the picture one where a person is crossing the road and the other where a person is walking far away from the roadside. Um, clearly, identifying the person correctly is far more important in the first case as compared to the second one. So our work, in our work, we actually posit that each decision taken by the learner has a context-dependent utility. And a key characteristic of this utility function is that it is unknown to the learner a priori before the task begins. Now, given this insight, the question that we ask in our work is how does one model this decision problem with an unknown and arbitrary utility function? So in order to answer this question, our work proposes this framework of agnostic learning with unknown utilities, which actually generalizes the classical agnostic learning framework. So formally, the learner is presented with a data set consisting of n data points where each xi is sampled from some unknown distribution d. We denote by script f the class of decision-making functions which map from the space of covariates to the space of decisions. Um, we further denote by u star the true underlying utility function, which is unknown to the learner. And lastly, there is an information oracle which, with which the learner can interact and get more information about the different decisions and the underlying utility u star. So as I mentioned earlier, our framework moves away from placing any assumption on this underlying utility function u star and just posits that the decision function can only be selected from this class script f. 
given this framework, the objective of the learner is to output a function f hat, which has small excess risk when evaluated on this true unknown utility function u star. Now, given this setup, uh, the, the question here is what should be this information oracle? Uh, this oracle should actually be powerful enough to make any kind of learning feasible, but should also not be too overly complicated for so that like human experts are not able to answer these queries. So let's jump into this information oracle now. And the first contender for such an information oracle is the value oracle. So in this, uh, given a context X and a decision, the human expert provides the exact value of the underlying utility function when evaluated on, on this context decision pair. However, note that this utility function can actually be quite complex and it makes it hard for human experts to accurately provide these value judgments. And this actually makes it infeasible to deploy such an oracle in practice. So on the other hand, it is often easier for humans to provide comparative evaluation based on these utilities. So for instance, one can query the human with a context and a pair of decisions and just ask uh, which one of those two has a higher utility when evaluated on the true utility U star. Such comparative feedback is, is actually very limited in the kind of information it provides to the learner. And I'm just gonna explain that with the help of a very small example. So consider these two classifiers, F1 and F2, and observe that both of them make the same number of mistakes. F1 mispredicts X3 and F2 mispredicts X1. Note that just by interacting with the comparison oracle, <clears throat> no learner will be able to understand the trade-off between these different mistakes and as a, as a much stronger statement, one can actually show that the excess risk for any algorithm which interacts only with the comparison oracle will actually be order one. So while this oracle is actually easy to implement on the human side, it's, it's actually information theoretically limited. Now, just to go to the other extreme, one can imagine a very powerful oracle, uh, which we call the infinite comparison oracle. And this oracle takes in two functions, F1 and F2, and the human expert outputs which of these has a higher utility when evaluated on the underlying distribution D. And note that this oracle is actually, it, it, it's very powerful and any learning algorithm can actually figure out which is the best function F in the function class script F by interacting with this oracle. However, it actually places all the burden of learning on the human expert it's effectively asking them to make to compare decisions across an infinite number of contexts. So thus, while this is Oracle is information theoretically optimal, uh, this Oracle is practically infeasible to implement. In order to overcome these limitations of existing mechanism, our work proposes a new type of comparison Oracle, which we call the K comparisons. This, this type of information feedback actually interpolates between the vanilla comparisons and the infinite comparisons. So in this, the human expert is given a bucket of k different context vectors, x1 to xk, and two sets of associated decision vectors. And the human here is required to compare these two bundles and output which of these two has a higher combined utility. Uh, observe that by setting k equals to one and k equals to infinity, we can, we can recover back the vanilla comparisons and the infinite comparisons. And one thing to note here is that as this order K of the comparison increases, it, it actually gets cognitively harder and harder for the human to actually provide this kind of feedback. So going forward in this talk, we'll focus on this problem of agnostic learning with unknown utilities where this information oracle is the K comparison oracle. With this setup, I'll, uh, I'll briefly describe our main algorithm. Uh, this is simply a two-stage plug-in estimator. Uh, one, in the, one minute. Yes. Yeah. In, in, the first step, uh, in the first step, the algorithm obtains the estimates you had on the sample data points using the K comparisons. And in the next step, it outputs the empirical utility maximizer in the class script F. Uh, in our work, we actually study the statistical properties of this plug-in estimator and show that it's minimax optimal. In the course of our analysis, we also in uncover an interesting accuracy elicitation trade-off. So as the order K of this oracle increases, uh, the error decreases at a rate of one over K as can be seen from the upper bound theorem. However, as we had noted earlier, increasing this error actually increases, increasing this order makes it harder and harder for the human to provide these responses more accurately. 
Thus, by varying this value of k, one can cover an entire spectrum of this trade-off. So just to conclude, our work actually formalizes a class of supervised learning problems wherein the underlying utility functions is unknown to the learner a priori. And we study a very natural plug-in estimator and show that it's minimax optimal. Uh, that's it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Last, we're going to talk about quantum speed up uh, and gradient descent. Thanks. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. And then record that after this talk, we have the panel session and we can ask all the questions that we want to the speakers. Yeah. Looks good, Robin. You can go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, so my, my talk's going to be uh, answering the question, can quantum computers speed up gradient descent? Uh, this joint work with uh, Ankit Garg, Praneet Netrapali, and Suhail Sharif. So this is going to be a high-level talk, I mean, partly because it's an eight-minute talk and partly because I don't want to assume that the audience knows either quantum computing or optimization. So, okay, let's, let's start with the question. Um, and I mean, well, this is part of the optimization session, so at least I, I assume that the audience would know what gradient descent is. If you don't, it's not a big deal, but like the specific details of the algorithm are not relevant for this talk, but it's all you need to keep in mind is it's some algorithm for minimizing functions in Rn. Okay, so this was the question uh, that motivates this work. And if you think about this question for, for a few minutes, you might you might realize like, what, what does this question even mean? What does it, what does it mean for a quantum algorithm to speed up a classical algorithm. It's, it's not clear this question is meaningful. So for example, does Shor's algorithm speed up the best classical algorithm for factoring numbers? I mean, as far as I know, Shor's algorithm is just a quantum algorithm that solves the factorization problem, but it's not a speed up of the classical algorithm. And it doesn't look like the classical algorithm at all. So you have to be a little careful in formalizing this question. And this is like a naive way of formalizing, which is not very helpful, which says that the quantum algorithm should do exactly what gradient descent does. Basically, should output the same sequence of points that gradient descent would output in its, uh, you know, quest for finding the minimum of this function. Uh, but this is not really helpful because we're kind of forcing the quantum algorithm to do exactly the same thing that the classical algorithm would do. So, uh, I think this is not the right way to look at the question. What, what is meaningful to ask is we can say quantum computers solve a specific problem faster than gradient descent. So, like in the Shor's algorithm example, we can say quantum computers solve the factorization problem faster than any known classical algorithm. So th that's how we choose to formalize this question. And so what we want to do is we want to find a problem uh, that can be solved by gradient descent. And furthermore, for which gradient descent is the optimal classical algorithm, because otherwise even classical algorithms would solve that problem faster than gradient descent. So we want to take a problem that somehow characterizes gradient descent, like it uh, really captures the power of gradient descent. And then we'll ask, can quantum algorithms solve this problem faster? Fortunately, there's a very canonical problem that does this. And if you don't, don't care for the motivation on this slide, you can just forget about this motivation and we can just skip to the problem. So the problem we study is this problem called first order black box convex optimization. If you've read any textbooks on this topic, like th this problem will appear in like the first two or three chapters. So there's, there, there's a bunch of good textbooks. There's one by Nestrov and um, Seb also has a very nice monograph on this subject and it's like in chapter two of his book. So this is the problem for a starter black box convex optimization. You're given uh, a convex function in Rn, f. It's Lipschitz constant uh, we, we know is at most g. Uh, if you don't know what the Lipschitz constant is, it, just think of it as some upper bound on how quickly the function varies. So it's an upper bound on its derivative. So the function doesn't wiggle too fast in a small uh, space. Uh, and we want to minimize this function on b0, comma r. This is the unit, uh, or not the unit ball, but the ball of radius r around the origin. And so x star is this minimizer. And you don't have to output x star. You, you just have to output an approximation to x star. So you want to find some point x such that f of x minus f of x star is less than epsilon. And the quantity we're trying try to minimize is the number of times you evaluate the function and its gradient. So that's the only thing we're trying to minimize, just how many evaluations you make of f and grad f. OK, so first, let's talk about classical algorithms for this problem. Um, so if you, if you note, Notice in the problem, there's actually four different free parameters, n, g, r, and epsilon. But it turns out that um, truly there's only two parameters. And that's because there's some freedom in the function. So we can rescale the domain and range. And that won't really change the problem. So two of the parameters are really spurious. So you should think of this problem as having only two parameters, n and g, r over epsilon. OK, so now we can ask, 
what is the optimal classical algorithm? And it turns out there's two optimal classical algorithms, um, which you can neatly call the dimension independent algorithm or dimension dependent algorithm. So the dimension independent algorithm has complexity GR over epsilon squared and gradient descent, for example, will do this. And dimension dependent algorithms, there's many of them and they have complexity order N uh, log GR over epsilon. Okay, and what do I mean by these are both optimal? What I mean is you look at these two expressions so, and whichever one is smaller, that's, um, you can use that algorithm, of course, and that's actually optimal. And so for example, when N is very large, so it's polynomially larger than GR over epsilon, then it's clear that you should use gradient descent. That's the smaller bound. And in that regime, that's the best algorithm. So what do I mean formally? Let me just um, recap. This is the formal problem for sort of black box convex optimization. Gradient descent solves this problem with GR over epsilon squared queries, independent of N, doesn't matter. And what can be shown is that no classical algorithm, even if it uses randomization, can solve this problem faster um, when n is large. So we're in this dimension independent setting. So we're thinking of n as being polynomially larger than GR or epsilon. Uh, no classical algorithm can do better. So in other words, gradient descent is the optimal algorithm. Okay, so now we have this very nice clean cut problem, which gradient descent solves optimally. And now we can ask, can quantum computers solve this problem faster? Right, so that's the problem we consider in this work. Um, because I don't want to assume people are, uh, understand quantum algorithms, I'll, I'll just leave it at this level of detail. For, formally, I'll have to explain exactly in what sense do quantum algorithms have access to F and grad F. So if you know what quantum algorithms are, uh, all I mean is you have access to F and grad F in, in superposition. That means you can make superposition queries to these two uh, functions. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the problem we set up. And one thing to do is we already know that classical algorithms need to take, you know, GR over epsilon squared queries to solve this problem. So there is some hard instance that appears in, these cl in this classical lower bound, right? So we can ask, well, can quantum computers do better at least on that hard instance, right? So that, that, that's always a good first place to start is you start out with the hardest instance for the classical algorithm and with your quantum algorithm. So instead of starting out trying to solve all instances faster, just start out with this. And we, we looked through the literature to find like the simplest classical lower bound instance we could find. And we, we, we came up with a nice one that we don't think appears in the lower literature anywhere, but it's, it's very clean. So let me, let me just tell you what it is. So as I said, there's, there's two spurious parameters. So we can just set GNR to one without loss of generality. So there's only one parameter epsilon and think of N as being arbitrarily large and I'll, I'll just choose it to be one or epsilon squared for this lower bound. And it turns out that you can choose this family of functions, uh, FZ parameterized by an N bit string Z. And it's just a very simple function. It's just basically a max of the N standard basis vectors XI with a random sign in front of them, like a plus minus one, but we don't know. And it turns out, and the proof is not hard at all. We, we include this in our paper. It's, it's pretty slick proof, shows that any classical algorithm, even with randomization, must make one over epsilon squared queries. And this is optimal. Of course, it's, it's matched by gradient descent. And the, so the first thing that we observed is there is actually a quantum speed up for this family of functions. So this family of functions is hard for classical algorithms. You can actually solve it with one over epsilon queries in the quantum world. Uh, and it uses a, a very non-trivial algorithm, a quantum algorithm called Belov's algorithm for combinatorial group testing. So it's not using Grover's algorithm, which is the usual suspect when you see quadratic speedups. Um, okay, yeah, so, so quantum algorithms can solve this family of functions with a quadratic speedup. So, so here's, a, here's, a, here's a recap of what's going on. So there is a hard family of functions that appears in this classical lower bound that, and in the lower bound, we, it's pretty easy to show that you need one over epsilon squared queries to solve this problem. Um, to solve this first order black box convex minimization problem on this family of functions. But on this family of functions, quantum algorithms can solve the problem faster with a quadratic speed up. Uh, you know, so it's one or epsilon instead of one or epsilon squared. And so, you know, obviously it's, so the question is, can you always get a quadratic speed up for this problem? Or was this just kind of a coincidence that we just found a nice set of um, functions that was hard for classical algorithms, but doesn't, it, but it's not hard for quantum algorithms. And the main contribution of this work is, uh, well, actually, well, this was just a coincidence, I guess, uh, there exists a different family of hard functions for which even quantum algorithms must make one. And answer. Robin, just a clarification question. If instead of taking the linear function random on the hypercube, you were taking it random on the sphere, would the quantum speedup still be possible? Uh, no, the quantum speedup doesn't persist, but we also don't know uh, how to show that that function's hard for quantum. So, so 
open. Oh, I see. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So, okay, but what do you think? I suspect it's hard, but that our techniques will not be able to show it. Okay, so maybe we you sh I should let you conclude, and then we can move to the panel discussion. Sure. So maybe one minute for the conclusion. Okay. So right, so there exists a different family of hard functions that we constructed um, for which and we proved the lower bound. So you know the conclusion of this talk is that well, okay, there's no quantum speed up in this setting, the setting of first order black box convex opposition over gradient descent. And since I have a few seconds, let me say a little bit about what what was the difficult part here. Uh, well, first we had to find a different family of hard functions. This is this was not the hard part. Uh, this kind of many families of hard functions have been studied as, as sub alluded to. You can take. Uh, random vectors on the sphere. We need some more stuff, but it turns out there's a lot of, um, there's literature on proving lower bounds for this problem in the setting of parallel queries, where you're allowed to make qu randomized queries in parallel. And they've constructed, this literature um, has constructed a lot of crazy functions and you know one of them turned out to be useful for us. So that was on the convex optimization side. We borrowed heavily from this parallel lower bounds technology. On the quantum side, the difficult part is that uh, almost all standard quantum lower bound techniques are developed for Boolean functions. So where you query an Oracle, that's just an n bit string. Here, the problem is we're querying this, this thing f and grad f, which are you know, uh, n real numbers, for example. And the techniques aren't suited, well suited for this kind of stuff. So th this is part of what made lower bound really hard to prove. And finally, we use this technique called the hybrid argument, which if you're familiar with quantum lower bounds is one of the earliest ones that was ever used. And that's all I want to say. Right. Great. Thanks a lot, Robin. Uh, so now we move to the uh, panel discussion part of the session. So the floor is open to ask a question about any of the talks uh, that we've seen. And we're maybe going to start with a question from the audience that was asked by uh, Mayank uh, Baskar. Uh, it's a question for Cameron. Uh, so Mayank is asking, if I understand correctly, what happens in practice? I mean, it's a very clean heuristic that you have. Do you know what happens in practice with k prime? Can you take k prime close to k? Uh, what does it look like? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not really sure. So we haven't really messed around with it too much in practice. The, the heuristic is super simple. It's not doing anything smart. It's just zeroing out the mass entries and then doing a low rank approximation. So I think if you drive k prime close to k, it's not going to do well. So you really do need that by criteria for it to do well, but I don't really know exactly what they how big K prime really needs to be. Cool. Um, okay, maybe I can ask a, a question to Kevin. Uh, and again, uh, for the audience, feel free to you know speak up and ask questions. So Kevin, you talked about uh, relative uh, Lipschitzness, and I just wanted to clarify: it's very different from relative convexity. I mean, there is this notion of relative smoothness and relative strong convexity. And maybe you can just comment on how relative Lipschitzness is very different from relative smoothness. Right. So in the case when the monotone operator is just the gradient of a convex function, um, our our uh, condition uh, incorporates that of relative smoothness. So it like this is actually like how we got its name. Um, but it, it it turns out that like to to, to really capture this uh, these more fine grained analyses, you have like mm, there's like an informal statement we make that like relative smoothness is really a condition between two points. It's like a integral along like a line. And then mm -hmm. like relative Lipschitzness like sort of requires three points, um, which is like why the discretization has to take multiple steps. Um, this, this same kind of phenomenon was found in the, um, was mentioned before in terms of ex explaining acceleration and area convexity and things like this. So we try to make it a little bit more formal. Um, yeah, very good. I, I also have a, Kind of silly question. Um, how do I ask questions in the Q and A, or maybe I can oh, just ask? Oh, you, you you can just pick up. We don't need to ask them in okay, the Q and A. Right. Uh, um, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I, I I had a question for Robin. Um, oh, really really awesome talk. Um, so I, I was just wondering in, in the model you're considering, um, is like uh, is your hard family also a hard family for classical algorithms? Like is uh is uh is the in the in the model is like. Can quantum algorithms simulate all classical algorithms so that this would immediately follow? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. Right. Okay, okay. So yeah, the model is, I guess, correctly defined so that quantum algorithms will uh, be able to simulate classical algorithms. With, I see. Yeah. That's really cool. And, and so the same lower bound, of course, also holds for classical algorithms. Like one question I have is like, 
probably been like, are there, I mean, is that the end of the story? Like uh, quantum just doesn't work for convex optimization or do you think that there's some good class of problems where it can get big speed ups or? Uh, oh uh, yeah, it's certainly not the end of the story. In fact, this is like, uh, as I said, it's like like chapter one or chapter two of Seb's monograph. That, that's all I've read so far, but like, no, it, there's many different settings to consider. This is like the most basic assumption you can make on a function is just all that you know is that it's Lipschitz. The, like, um, the next assumption you could make, which is also very reasonable, is you can assume it's smooth. And then it turns out that even gradient descent is not the classic, optimal classical algorithm, it's accelerated gradient descent. Um, and actually in this case, we can also pr prove, uh, yeah, we haven't put this out yet, but we can prove that there's no quantum speed up over accelerated gradient descent when you assume the function is smooth. So that's another case we've ruled out, but you can assume so much stuff. Like, I mean, you can assume higher order smoothness. This, we're not sure what happens. Um, or you could assume more specific structure on the functions, right? Like this is probably getting closer to reality where maybe the function is a sum of simple functions or uh, you, maybe you know something else about it. Like, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a neural network that you're trying to train. Uh, yeah, we kind of view this as just like, we asked the most basic question and got a negative answer, but it's, it's no reason to be, uh, yeah, disappointed. For, for, for the smooth case, yeah, is there at least another algorithm that looks substantially different than AGD that gets the quadratic speed up, like using uh, uh, powerful uh, quantum tools? Oh, uh, I guess oh, yeah. that's an upper bound question. That's not really the question. Yeah, that's a really interesting yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know if there's a different quantum algorithm, like a genuinely quantum way to get the accelerator getting speed up. Uh, although there could be, um, because somehow the intuition that gives you the acceler acceleration and gradient descent, like you could say, you know, there's a quadratic speed up going on inside accelerator gradient descent. And you could say it's the same quadratic speed up that happens in Grover's algorithm, which is like, you know, the most famous quantum algorithm. So, so there could be a way to somehow get accelerated gradient descent in a genuinely quantum way. But um, I don't know. There, there was also this original motivation for accelerating descent with like some, with a heavy ball falling in a potential and so on. And this was also inspired somehow by classical physics. So you might think there's some quantum way to re-derive AGD, but uh, I don't know any. Oh, that would, that would be fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it'd be cool. Of course, the physics intuition was wrong and, and you know, Polyak's momentum does not work and does not give you acceleration. So the whole point was to fix physics. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, I have another question. So in your talk, uh, you know, you mentioned that your framework is unifying, but does it also give you new application? Um, right. So that's a uh, yeah. It, it, we're we're exploring. We're in on, it's an ongoing exploration. Yeah. So uh, so far, it seems to just yield like known rate, like known rates in a new way. But we think it might have cool applications for um, uh, like minimax optimization and things like this. Well, and actually, for the first question I asked, I wanted to ask just a follow up. So you say, you know. I understood your answer, but does it does relative Lipschitzness formally imply relative smoothness? Oh, oh I see. Um, so of course not the other way, but uh... Uh, sorry, let me think about that. Right. So if no, I think it's it's, it's a weaker condition. Yeah. Um, I think you can be relatively Lipschitz without being relatively smooth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can be relatively Lipschitz without... Like, relative. if you are relatively smooth, you are also relatively Lipschitz, but... Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 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 I understand. Because we don't, we cannot get acceleration for relative smoothness. Right, right, exactly. Uh, yeah, okay, perfect. Very good, excellent. Uh, okay, another question from uh, Mayong. What the discretization applied in quantum query models that converts continuous quantum spaces. I'm not sure I understand the question, but maybe you do. Yeah, I'm not totally sure what uh, they meant. Yeah, maybe you could clarify. Uh, sure. Is, yeah, is Mayank here? So I have another question in the meantime, if Mayank wants to uh, clarify uh, by writing um, uh, for Kirsch actually. So in, in your talk, when you talk about this comparison based uh, algorithm and the, and the result for them, um, one issue is that you're not gonna be able, like if you, if you think about real uh, machine learning application where you try to train those deep neural networks using gradient descent, et cetera, you're not gonna be able to run those algorithms even using the K uh, the K comparison oracle with a large K, right? So, 
Um, I, I mean, the way that our estimator works, it's, it's like in the first step, there has been just this estimation of the utilities part. And the next step is just like solving the ERM problem. So once you have the estimates, it, I mean, you can actually use any sort of gradient descent or any, any kind of neural network problem to solve those kind of uh, optimization problems. So our, our, in the first step is where you need to interact with the comparison oracle to just get information about these underlying utilities. But the next step is just an ERM optimization problem, which I guess you can have the script F being a neural network and doing optimization over that for the next step. So that couples well with the, like, I mean, that, that's why our estimator was such a simple estimator that you can couple it with uh, existing techniques to solve for the second part. I see, okay. Makes sense. Uh, well, I, I can try to answer the question as best I understand. I think the question is basically about like how you define this um, Oh, okay. Uh, there is a clarification posted. It says to clarify the discretization required from a practitioner's perspective, which is required to solve. Uh, I see. Yeah. So uh, I, I guess, you know, even, even classically, like you don't really want to think about getting real valued answers and inputs and so on, because, you know, you're, you're trying to do this on a computer and like everything's discrete and so on. Um, so to handle this, like, because we are proving lower bounds, we, we actually just assume that everything is available to arbitrarily many bits of precision. It's not gonna matter for us because our result would only be stronger to handle this case. Uh, but I think the more realistic way to do it is you assume that all your uh, Oracle responses only come out to so many bits of precision, but you just choose this number of bits of precision to be some, somewhat larger than anything that's relevant. So uh, let's say like polynomial and all the parameters that, that are involved in the problem so that now it doesn't matter that the fact that you're um, only truncating it. Uh, but yeah, for the purpose of our lower bound, we just assume you, you can ask for arbitrarily many bits to the Oracle. You can say, give me you know 8 billion bits of precision for this query and the Oracle will give it to you. And we're just proving lower bounds. So, so it's okay. Makes sense. Maybe one last question for, for Cameron. Um, do you have any conjecture or guess for the low rank plus diagonal? Um, yeah, man, we worked on that for a long time, but I don't feel like we're great at proving complexity lower bounds. I feel like it probably oh, so you is... conjecture it's hard. Yeah, we tried to prove that it was hard for a while because, we, yeah, we know how to give like um, runtimes that are exponential in the rank K. So it's not hard in the sense that it's exponential in N or anything like that. Um, but we couldn't get a lower bound, but I think it's hard. But it's kind of surprising because it's a super simple um problem uh, wait i sorry i'm super confused by something what happens for by criteria for the diagonal question? so for for a diagonal plus low rank if i have if i allow myself rank k over epsilon then yeah. i'm able to get a low rank approximation that's within additive epsilon times the forbidden norm of the optimal rank k so i only need rank like k over epsilon um, and you can use, we actually have a whole section of this paper that tack, tries to tackle that diagonal plus low rank problem in the non bi criteria setting and gets things that are like exponential in K over epsilon, but we couldn't go beyond this. And we also couldn't prove hardness. I see. And the K prime, which becomes K over epsilon, does it follow from the communication complexity? Um, yeah. So that becomes, so it's actually literally like 32 K over epsilon. And this comes from the fact that the communication complexity of inequality is like five log base two of mm -hmm. one over epsilon or something. And awesome. so when you raise two to that power, you get uh, like 32 over epsilon, this multiplies your rank. Um, That's quite beautiful, nice. Yeah, so it's actually in the, so I think, yeah, if I remember correctly, if you have an exact low rank plus diagonal decomposition, meaning I can adjust the diagonal in matrix to make it low rank, this problem has a name that I can't remember right now. It's not like, it has a name it has been studied. And in that case, under some relatively like weak assumptions, you can solve it via convex relaxation. Um, but without those assumptions, we still, even when you have an exact- Wait, if it's exact, we don't, we, you're saying you still need extra assumptions? If it's exact, you yeah, don't know. Like, I don't, we don't even know how to do it if it's exact, which is kind of crazy. So that might be an easier case to try to tackle. Okay, very interesting. I mean, I would have imagined that if it's exact, okay, I don't know. I mean, you would think what you, you would want, well, yeah, the rough idea of what you would wanna do is you'd wanna find full rank blocks of the off diagonals. 
and, and then propagate, then you could fill in the on diagonals if you found four eight blocks of the off diagonals. Um, but the trouble is like finding those four eight blocks um, is difficult. Yeah, I, I, I think I understand. Cool, great. Yeah, I can, yeah, anyways, yeah. Okay, if there is no more questions, thank you everyone. And we have one more session of ITCS. So feel free to hop on to room B. Thank you very much again. Thank you.